Chapter Five: The Derby Winner. As its name denotes, Beorminster was built on a hill, or, to speak more precisely, on an eminence elevated slightly above the surrounding plain. In former times it had been surrounded by aguish marshes, which had rendered the town unhealthy, but now that modern enterprise had drained the Finlands, Beorminster was as salubrious a town as could be found in England. The rich black mud of the former bogs now yielded luxuriant harvests, and in autumn the city, with its mass of red-roofed houses climbing upward to the cathedral, was islanded in a golden ocean of wheat and rye and bearded barley. For the purposes of defence, the town had been built originally on the slope of the hill, under the very shadow of the minster, and round its base the massive old walls yet remained, which had squeezed the city into a huddled mass of uncomfortable dwellings within its narrow girdle. But now open life extended beyond these walls, and houses, streets, villas, and gardens spread into the plain on all sides. Broad white roads ran to Southbury Junction, ten miles away. To manufacturing iron grip, the smoke of whose furnaces could be seen on the horizon, and to many a tiny hamlet and sleepy town buried amid the rich meadowlands and golden cornfields. And high above all lorded the stately cathedral, with its trio of mighty towers, whence morning and evening melodious bells pealed through the peaceful lands. Beyond the walls the modern town was made up of broad streets and handsome shops. On its outskirts appeared comfortable villas and stately manors, gardens, and woody parks, in which dwelt the aristocracy of Beorminster. But the old town, with its tall houses and narrow lanes, was given over to the plebeians, save in the cathedral close, where dwelt the canons, the dean, the archdeacon, and a few old-fashioned folk who remained by preference in their ancestral dwellings. From this close, which surrounded the open space, wherein the cathedral was built, narrow streets trickled down to the walls, and here was the Seven Dials, the White Chapel, the very worst corner of Beorminster. The Burminster police declared that this network of lanes and alleys and malodorous cul-de-sacs was as dangerous a neighbourhood as any London slum, and they were particularly emphatic in denouncing the public-house known as the Derby Winner, and kept by a certain William Mosk, who was a sporting scoundrel and a horsey scamp. This ill-famed hostel was placed at the foot of the hill, in what had once been the main street, and being near the east gate, caught in its web most of the thirsty passers-by who entered the city proper, either for sight-seeing or business. It affected a kind of spurious respectability, which was all on the outside, for within it was as iniquitous a den as could well be conceived and was usually filled with horse-copers and sporting characters who made bets and talked racing and rode or drove fiery steeds and who lived on and swindled through the noblest of all animals mr mosk a lean lightweight who wore loud check suits tight in the legs and short in the waist was the presiding deity of this inferno and, as the Ormuz to this Aramanes, Gabriel Pendle was the curate of the district, charged with the almost hopeless task of reforming his sporting parishioners. And all this, with considerable irony, was placed almost in the shadow of the cathedral towers. Not a neighbourhood for Mr. Cargram to venture into, since many sights therein must have displeased his exact tastes. Yet two days after the reception at the palace the chaplain might have been seen daintily picking his way over the cobblestone pavements. As he walked, he thought, and his thoughts were busy with the circumstances which had led him to venture his saintly person so near the spider's web of the Derby winner. The bishop, 
london curiosity gabriel this unpleasant neighbourhood so ran the links of his chain of thought the day following his unexpected illness brought no relief to the bishop at all events to outward seeming for he was paler and more haggard than ever in looks and as dour as a bear in manner with mrs pendle he strove to be his usual cheerful self but with small success as occasionally he would steal an anxious look at her and heave deep sighs expressive of much inward trouble all this was noted by cargrim who carefully strove by sympathetic looks and dexterous remarks to bring his superior to the much desired point of unburdening his mind gabriel had returned to his lodgings near the east gate and to his hopeless task of civilizing his degraded centaurs lucy after the manner of maids in love was building air castles with sir harry's assistance and mrs pendle kept her usual watch on her weak heart and fluctuating pulse the bishop thus escaped their particular notice and it was mainly cargrim who saw how distraught and anxious he was as for dr graham he had departed after a second unsatisfactory visit swearing that he could do nothing with a man who refused to make a confidant of his doctor bishop pendle was therefore wholly at the mercy of his suspicious chaplain to be spied upon to be questioned to be watched and to be made a prey of in his first weak moment but the worried man filled with some unknown anxiety was quite oblivious to cargrim's manoeuvres for some time the chaplain in spite of his watchfulness failed to come upon anything tangible likely to explain what was in the bishop's mind he walked about restlessly he brooded continuously and instead of devoting himself to his work in his usual regular way occupied himself for long hours in scribbling figures on his blotting-paper and muttering at times in anxious tones cargrim examined the blotting-paper and strained his ears to gather the sense of the mutterings but in neither case could he gain any clue to the bishop's actual trouble at length it was on the morning of the second day after the reception dr pendle abruptly announced that he was going up to london that very afternoon and would go alone the emphasis he laid on this last statement still further aroused cargrim's curiosity shall i not accompany your lordship he asked as the bishop restlessly paced the library no mr cargrim why should you said the bishop abruptly and testily your lordship seems ill and i thought there is no need for you to think sir i am not well and my visit to london is in connection with my health or with your secret thought the chaplain deferentially bowing i have every confidence in dr graham continued pendle but it is my intention to consult a specialist i need not go into details mr cargrim as they will not interest you oh your lordship your health is my constant thought your anxiety is commendable but needless responded the bishop dryly i am due at southbury this sunday i believe there is a confirmation at st mark's your lordship very good you can make the necessary arrangements mr cargrim to-day is thursday i shall return to-morrow night and shall rest on saturday until the evening when i shall ride over to southbury attend at st mark's and return on sunday night does not your lordship desire my attendance asked cargrim although he knew that he was the morning preacher at the cathedral on sunday no answered dr pendle curtly i shall go and return alone the bishop looked at cargrim and cargrim looked at the bishop each striving to read the other's thoughts then the latter turned away with a frown and the former much exercised in his mind advanced towards the door of the library dr pendle called him back 
"'Not a word about my health to Mrs. Pendle,' he said sharply. "'Certainly not, your lordship. You can rely upon my discretion in every way,' replied the chaplain, with emphasis, and glided away as soft-footed as any panther, and as dangerous. "'I wonder what that fellow suspects,' thought the bishop when alone. "'I can see that he is filled with curiosity, but he can never find out the truth, or even guess at it. I am safe enough from him. All the same, I'll have a fool for my next chaplain. Fools are easier to deal with." Cargram would have given much to have overheard this speech, but as the door and several passages were between him and the talker, he was ignorant of the incriminating remarks the bishop had let slip. Still baffled, but still curious, he busied himself with attending to some business of the sea which did not require the personal supervision of Dr. Pendle, and when that prelate took his departure for London by the three o'clock train, Cargram attended him to the station, full of meekness and irritating attentions. It was with a feeling of relief that the bishop saw his officious chaplain left behind on the platform. He had a secret, and, with the uneasiness of a loaded conscience, fancied that every one saw that he had something to conceal, particularly Cargram. In the presence of that good young man, this spiritual lord, high-placed and powerful, felt that he resembled an insect under a microscope, and that Cargram had his eye to the instrument. Conscience made a coward of the bishop but in the case of his chaplain his uneasy feelings were in some degree justified. On leaving the railway station, which was on the outskirts of the modern town, Cargram took his way through the brisk population which thronged the streets, and wondered in what manner he could benefit by the absence of his superior. As he could not learn the truth from Dr. Pendle himself, he thought that he might discover it from an investigation of the bishop's desk. For this purpose he returned to the palace forthwith, and on the plea of business shut himself up in the library. Dr. Pendle was a careless man, and never locked up any drawers, even those which contained his private papers. Cargram, who was too much of a sneak to feel honourable scruples, went through these carefully, but in spite of all his predisposition to malignity, was unable to find any grounds for suspecting Dr. Pendle to be in any serious trouble. At the end of an hour he found himself as ignorant as ever, and made only one discovery of any note, which was that the bishop had taken his cheque-book with him to London. To many people this would have seemed a natural circumstance, as most men with banking accounts take their cheque-books with them when going on a journey. But Cargram knew that the bishop usually preferred to fill his pockets with loose cash when absent for a short time, and this deviation from his ordinary habits appeared to be suspicious. Hmm, thought the chaplain, rubbing his chin. I wonder if that so-called clergyman wanted money. If he had wished for a small sum, the bishop could easily have given it to him out of the cash-box. Going by this reasoning, he must have wanted a lot of money, which argues blackmail. Hmm, has he taken both cheque-books, or only one? The reason for this last query was that Bishop Pendle had accounts in two different banks one in Berminster, as became the Bishop of the See, the other in London, in accordance with the dignity of a spiritual Lord of Parliament. A further search showed Mr. Cargram that the Berminster cheque-book had been left behind. Hmm, said the chaplain again, that man must have gone back to London. Dr. Pendle is going to meet him there, and draw money from his town bank to pay what he demands. I'll have a look at the butts of that cheque-book when it comes back. The amount of the cheque may prove much. I may even find out the name of this stranger." But all this, as Cargram very well knew, was pure theory. 
the bishop might have taken his cheque-book to london for other reasons than paying blackmail to the stranger for it was not even certain that there was any such extortion in the question dr pendle was worried it was true and after the departure of his strange visitor he had been taken ill but these facts proved nothing and after twisting and turning them in every way and connecting and disconnecting them with the absence of the london cheque-book mr cargrim was forced to acknowledge that he was beaten for the time being then he fancied he might extract some information from gabriel relative to his father's departure for london for mr cargrim was too astute to believe in the consulting a specialist excuse still this might serve as a peg whereon to hang his inquiries and develop further information so the chaplain after meditating over his five o'clock cup of tea took his way to the east gate in order to put gabriel unawares into the witness-box yet for all these doings and suspicions cargrim had no very good reason save his own desire to get dr pendle under his thumb he was groping in the dark he had not a shred of evidence to suppose that the uneasiness of the bishop was connected with anything criminal nevertheless the chaplain put himself so far out of his usual habits as to venture into the unsavoury neighbourhood wherein stood the derby winner truly this man's cobweb spinning was of a very dangerous character when he took so much trouble to weave the web as in excelsior the shades of night were falling fast when cargrim found himself at the door of the curate's lodging here he met with a check for gabriel's landlady informed him that mr pendle was not at home and she did not know where he was or when he would be back cargrim made the sweetest excuses for troubling the good lady left a message that he would call again and returned along monk street on his way back to the palace through the new town by going in this direction he passed the derby winner not without intention for it was this young man's belief that gabriel might be haunting the public-house to see mrs mosk or as was more probable to the malignant chaplain her handsome daughter as he came abreast of the derby winner it was not too dark but that he could see a tall man standing in the doorway cargrim at first fancied that this might be gabriel and paced slowly along so as to seize an opportunity of addressing him but when he came almost within touching distance he found himself face to face with a dark-looking gipsy fiery-eyed and dangerous in appearance he had a lean cruel face a hawk's beak for a nose and black black hair streaked with grey but what mostly attracted cargrim's attention was a red streak which traversed the right cheek of the man from ear to mouth at once he recalled john's description a military-looking gentleman with a scar on the right cheek he thought hm this then is the bishop's visitor end of chapter five